Well, as you take your Bibles this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 11. We're going to spend the next four weeks uh, looking at the church at Antioch as we kick off uh, this year. But as you grab your Bible, uh, a couple things I want to let you know about. One is beginning this Sunday, uh, you will hear myself and all of other campus pastors preaching out of the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. Uh, Many of you know that for years we have been using the Holman Christian Standard Bible, uh, published by our friends at Lifeway. And of course, us pastors liked it because it gave us a little joke with the initials HCSB, Hardcore Southern Baptist, right? Translation of the Bible. Uh, but over the years, they incrementally released updates, uh, and they decided about a year ago just to go ahead and overhaul the entire translation. And so they have done so. Uh, and so we're moving to that translation. Now, your HCSB that you have, if you've invested in one of those, it'll still be very, very close. Uh, but uh, we've just decided because all the kids and student curriculum will line up with that, uh, all of the new mission resources that are released will be using the CSB. We're going to preach out of that translation. If you don't have a Bible, if you need a Bible, if you know someone who needs a Bible, we're going to have paperbacks of the CSB available for free at the new Discipleship Center out there to the left. So feel free to grab one of those uh, if you want that. And for those of you, of course, using a digital version, you just now have to search for the CSB, Christian Standard Bible, uh, and uh, you will arrive at exactly the wording uh, that we'll be preaching out of on Sunday mornings. But we're excited about this new year and all that God is doing. And uh, any Tennessee Titan fans out there? So... All right, yeah, everybody happy today? Kind of unexpected, shocker, won a playoff game. Uh, This week, I heard on the radio that the Titans had not been to the playoffs since January of 2009. And so the way that my brain works is I thought back to January 2009 and what was taking place then. Did you realize that the church at Station Hill didn't exist the last time the Tennessee Titans were in the playoffs? I don't know if that says more about their ineptitude the last eight years or or it speaks more to what God has done in a short period of time here, relatively speaking. Uh, But I definitely went back to that moment in my mind and I began to think about January of 2009 and where I was and what I was doing. And on a cold January night, In Wilson Hall, which is the fellowship hall at our Brentwood campus, a group of us gathered together who had been prayerfully talking about being a part of the launch team for the first campus out of our church. And on that night, we challenged people to commit. And so with Chris Barker, by the way, leading worship, so that was appropriate today. I want to put up a picture of this for you on the screen. We had 50 families who took a launch team covenant and they placed it on a door, symbolically stating that we wanted to be a part of creating new doors into the life of our campus and what God was doing in our community. You'll see there the picture of the team that compete, went on to complete that spring, the launch team training. And it's interesting because it's kind of fuzzy now. And we've looked for a better resolution copy, uh, kind of for church history purposes. Purposes and we can't find one, uh, basically because it was an afterthought. I think we pulled out maybe an iPhone 2, right? Uh, and somebody snapped a picture uh, of this group of people. And you know, I kind of like it that way. It's just interesting to think about how God uses people, faithful people, ordinary people like you and me to accomplish his purposes. And you know, it was interesting because in that same month, many of you will remember that the recession had hit hard. And so there were many people who came and kind of told me, hey, is, is this the best time to put resources and to launch campus? And other people within our church family say, you know, we don't really do the church multiplication thing very well. Maybe this isn't a good idea. I had other people here in the community of Spring Hill say, like, really? Like every strip mall in Spring Hill has two things, right? A Mexican restaurant and a new church, right? Does Spring Hill really need another church? Well, take a look around at you, look around this morning. Ponder all that God has done. In the last eight years, there have been almost 300 people baptized. In the last eight years, we've sent 250 people out of this congregation to serve alongside of mission partners nationally and internationally on mission journeys. Because This church began to have traction and grow roots and begin to thrive in this community. Our larger church family caught a hold of a vision for multiplication. And there are now five, soon to be six, maybe seven campuses meeting throughout Middle Tennessee today, declaring the good news of Jesus in their own community because this group of people were just simply willing to say, hey, I want to reach my neighbors. And you know, one of the things I love about the scriptures is the fact that they point to the fact that God simply uses faithful people to accomplish his purposes. 
The church we're going to spend the next four weeks looking at, the church at Antioch, as we start this new year as a model for us, was not started by the apostles. It wasn't started by Barnabas. It wasn't started by the apostle Paul. No, it was started by a bunch of people who we don't even know their names who simply told their neighbors about Jesus. And out of their faithfulness came the world's first great mission-sending church, the church at Antioch. As we enter a new chapter, a new season in the life of our church, that's what I want our church to look like. I love what God has done up to this point in the past eight years. I can't wait to see what he's going to continue to do as the vision for what he can accomplish through faithful people only grows larger and larger. So will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we begin into Acts chapter 11 with verses 19 through 21 this morning. Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen, made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you that we don't have to go far to find the mission and vision of your church. It's right there in the pages of Scripture. And so, Father, our responsibility is to be sure that our church lines up with biblical truth, with these biblical principles. So, Father, would we be diligent and urgent and intentional in making sure that our church reflects the values of the church at Antioch, the first church to catch hold of the vision for worldwide mission. Would we value the things that your heart values? Thank you for sending your son who makes it all possible. And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated this morning. So my goal for today's message is pretty simple. I want us to begin looking at the church at Antioch. I'm going to spend more time in these first three verses and kind of highlight the rest of the story of the church at Antioch because we'll be going back to revisit those parts of the story later this month. But I also want you to understand how those tie into the things that we value as a church and the things that we want to uphold as a people, the things that we should and want to value as well. And last but certainly not least, I want you to think the whole time in your mind, how is the Lord calling? me to be a part of what he's doing here through my local church family. And if you're not joined with us, should you consider joining with us on the great mission that God has given us? But I love the portrait that we get at the church at Antioch for several reasons. One is, of course, it's in the great scope of the story of what God is doing in the book of Acts. We call it the Acts of the Apostles, but it really should probably be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit because it's about how Jesus gave a mandate, a commission to his disciples. He looked at them when he ascended back to heaven and he said, you will be my witnesses. Imperative, you, right? Emphatic, you. The mission was entrusted to disciples of Jesus, to his followers. You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes on you, right? And you will receive my power and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, the place where you're at. You will be my witnesses in Judea, regionally, Samaria, right, to people who were traditionally the, the enemies of the Jewish people. They didn't get along. So you will be witnesses to people that you think are outside of the scope of God's work, to people that you don't get along with any other way, and ultimately to the ends of the earth. And what's fascinating is if you begin to walk through the book of Acts, you will begin to see that that's the exact format that Luke lays out for us as the Holy Spirit moves in those ways. It's interesting that scholars have observed that the church advanced by intentional gospel effort, right? To share the gospel, to plant churches, and to bring the gospel to new places, Acts 1.8. But there were also times when the gospel was advanced via Acts 8.1. And in Acts 8.1, we see Saul, who later became Paul, beginning his murderous attacks against the early church. And it says that the church was scattered out of Jerusalem. That word scattered, the same word in the first verse that we read today. And what's interesting about that word is that it's an agricultural word. 
It's a word that is literally the word picture in Greek of a farmer sowing seeds. And so what you need to see here is the reality is that the gospel will move forward under the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it happens very intentionally when churches step forward in the mission, but sometimes it happens despite ourselves. Let's be honest, sometimes we get comfortable and the church has to be pushed out of its comfort zone. And so what you see is the church there residing in Jerusalem all of a sudden shaken, but as the believers scatter for the sake of their lives, they carry what? the gospel with them. You see, what Satan always intends to sabotage, God will always superintend for his divine plan and his sovereign purposes. You see, the enemy is not omniscient. And so he unleashes a string of circumstances and events that he thinks will frustrate and stop the work of the Holy Spirit. But that work cannot be stopped. And so it's interesting when we begin to think about how we scatter in our day and age today. There are not very many of you who were born and raised in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Any locals among us today? Okay, uh, a handful, right? Most of us have come here. Yes, kids, yes, you do count. I saw several kids put their hands up. True, true, right? So it'll be a little different in the next generation in Spring Hill because there'll be a bunch of you who were born and raised here. But among us adults, many of us moved here, whether for a job or for better education for our family, those kind of purposes. There are others of you who the events of life have found you in this place. And you might find yourself wondering on some days, God, how in the world did I get here? Why am I in this house or this apartment in this neighborhood? Why am I in this job next to these people? Why am I in this school? Why am I rubbing shoulders with this group of people? But you see, what this passage teaches us is that God doesn't scatter people by accident. He does so intentionally. Because when we go and we recognize that our first priority, wherever we find ourselves, is the gospel of Jesus Christ, suddenly that transforms the reason that we're there. We know that God has put us there for a reason and a plan and a purpose. And so you're not here by accident. The other remarkable thing about this passage, of course, is the city of Antioch itself. Now we read that and for us it's just another in a list of ancient cities. But you need to understand that Antioch was the third largest city of the Roman Empire at the time. Behind only Rome and Alexandria. It was called the Queen City of the East. It was a major hub for commerce and trade. They had a port that fed into the Mediterranean Sea off a river there. It was a pluralistic culture in which people of different belief groups had come from all over the ancient Near East to congregate and gather there. It was a city of about half a million people. And when you begin to think about that, you begin to realize that this was an ideal place, an ideal launching pad for the global mission of the gospel. Because if it could take root in Antioch, the types of people who would be drawn to that city and then would spread out from there, the gospel would be carried all over the world. As a matter of fact, you might call Antioch the it city, right, of the first century in that part of the world. What do they call Nashville right now? The it city, right? God has drawn you to a regional hub. Sometimes it's called the third coast. You know why? Because next to New York and LA, no community, no city has greater impact on culture and the shaping of culture in North America probably than little old Nashville, Tennessee. People are moving here by the droves, which we know increases traffic, right? But it also increases our influence and our ability to impact the people that God is bringing here, maybe for a season, so that they can know and hear the gospel and so that this can be a launch pad. What an opportunity, what a privilege, what a time to be alive and to be a servant of Jesus Christ. That God is literally flooding our neighborhoods and our towns with thousands of families, with people who are hurting, searching, looking for answers. Did you know there are going to be a thousand housing units built within one mile of this campus within the next 24 to 36 months? That's more people that God is bringing right here to our very doorstep with whom we can share the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know you're having to say, traffic, traffic, get that out of my head, right? Gospel opportunity, gospel opportunity. But that's the reality. 
God has given us this moment. He's given us this chance. And what's fascinating about this story to me, as I mentioned earlier, God used a bunch of people and we don't even have their names to see a major barrier and threshold to the gospel crossed. You see, chapters 10 and 11 tell the story of Peter leading Cornelius, a Roman centurion, to faith. And so verse 18, the verse right before the one that we begin to read, reads this, talking about the report that came back to the church at Jerusalem. When they heard this, they became silent. They were literally speechless, trying to deal with the implications of what had just happened. Someone with a non-Jewish background and a hated Roman soldier at that had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And then they glorified God saying, so then God has given repentance resulting in life for salvation, even to the Gentiles. In other words, the gospel was not just for people with a Jewish background, but the gospel was for all people. And the rest of Luke's story and Acts is filled with these stories now of the gospel going to the Gentiles. And so what happens here is the believers are spread to Antioch, verse 20. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus, which is an island just about 100 miles off the coast, and Cyrene, which was in northern Africa at the time, who came to Antioch. We talked about how it was a hub and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. Now we have the saying in our Baptist churches, right? Well, we've never done it that way before, right? One of our favorite things to say. Well, here's what happens when new people get saved. They don't know the tradition of the church. They don't grasp, we've never done it that way before because they've never done anything before. All they want to do is tell people about the Jesus who has saved them. And so lo and behold, these guys, ignorant of the traditions, right, go and share Jesus with their neighbors who happen to speak Greek. They're Greek speaking. And it so happens that many of them respond to the gospel. Now, I want you to notice one thing, and it's easy to miss. They spoke to them about the Lord Jesus. Notice it doesn't say Messiah Jesus. Now, if these people had a Jewish background, it would make sense to speak to them about the Messiah, Jesus, the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament promises. But Greek people don't know the Old Testament. Therefore, they use the word Lord Jesus, kurios. And here's what was amazing about that statement is that everybody in the Roman Empire knew one person was Lord. Who was that? Caesar. Caesar was Lord, and to say anybody else was Lord was punishable in some places by death. And yet, here came these people who believed in Jesus, that he had come and died and was rose, he rose from the dead and that he had saved them, and they were willing to say, no, Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is Lord. But notice how they contextualize the message to fit with the audience. The truth was the same. Jesus is Messiah and Lord, as Peter says in Acts chapter 2. He is both of those things. But to this audience, they made the message fit. And it's a great reason why we have to learn to be gospel fluent. We spent a lot of time this year, or the past year, and we're going to spend more time this year talking to you about this concept of gospel fluency. This is why you need to be in the Word. As Leanne and Brian shared with you earlier, this is why we challenge you to read the Word, to immerse yourself in it so that your words reflect the words of Scripture, so the overflow of your heart is the word of God as it is translated, so to speak, into the lives of your neighbors, into the lives of your co-workers. In other words, Bible study isn't just about making you smarter so that you know more of the Bible, like so that you know more about Bible trivia or something, right? It's to transform you so that it can transform others. The, the word that has flow, come to you needs to flow through you into the lives of the people around you. And this is what we call gospel fluency. And this one little word gives us an indication that the church at Antioch, that these young believers knew the gospel and they were able to speak it to terms that their culture connected with. Now, to be very clear, that doesn't mean the message changed. The message never changes, right? The message of the gospel. But we have to be able to speak it in ways that connect with the people who are around us, the people who are our neighbors, the people who are our friends and coworkers and fellow students. And so we have to know the word so that we can share the word. And what was the result of this? We'll look at verse 21. The Lord's hand was with them and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. 
So the first reason that the church at Antioch was so incredibly uh, suited to be a model for us as a church was effective evangelism. Bottom line, it was the work of God in the lives of his people that made the difference. And then this leads us to reason number two, verse 22 through 24. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And large numbers of people were added to the Lord. So after number one, effective evangelism, comes number two, dynamic disciple making. And again, you're going to hear more about these next three in subsequent weeks. That's right. It's New Year's, so not just three points today, but four, right? Because you can handle it. You're ready to go in the new year. But dynamic disciple making, where we see new churches that grow under godly leadership who know the priority of making disciples who will make more disciples. So the church at Jerusalem, we don't know if they were a little skeptical or if they just wanted to support the work that was going on there in Antioch or both. But they send one of their best, right? Barnabas. We were introduced to him in Acts 4. We know that his real name is Joseph. Barnabas is actually a nickname, which means son of encouragement. But that's how he was known by the church. And he is the right man for the job. He's trusted. He's respected. And he comes to see what God is doing at Antioch. And when he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he encouraged them. Every church needs its encouragers, and I love the encouragement that I see often happening among many of you to validate and to point out the grace of God operating in the lives of one another. Barnabas had the ability to do this, and in doing so, he strengthened the church. But not only that, something really curious happens in verse 25. As the church is continuing to grow, I feel like Barnabas had a great handle. He was a mature leader, and he knew that whereas he could have kind of been the star pastor and the CEO there at Antioch, he knew someone else was needed to strengthen the church. And so he forms the world's first one-man pulpit committee. He goes in verse 25 to Tarsus to search for Saul, who we know as Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, Luke points out, an entire year, they met with the church and they taught large numbers. So Barnabas and Paul in tandem teach the entire church for a year. They disciple them for a year. And what is the result? Well, the very community around them sees a change in this group of people. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Did you realize that? That we did not give the name Christians to ourselves. Instead, it was the unbelieving population of Antioch that looked at these followers of Jesus and said, these people look like little Christs. That's what the word Christian means. These people are smaller reflections of the Jesus that they love and serve. These people look like him. A smaller version of him, of course, but this is who these people are, that they're not just some sect within Judaism, but they're their own people group. They were that distinct and they stood out that much in the culture. And it begs the question for us today, if our culture was to label us, would they say the same thing? Would they look at us and say, Hey, those people, man, they're, they're just like the Savior and Lord that they claim to follow. They're just a smaller version, right? Or would they call us something else entirely? Well, it was there in Antioch that they were first called Christian, little Christ, a great testimony to what the Word of God was doing in them. But that's not where Luke ends the story. No, there's a third reason that this is a model church for us, and that's their faith-fueled generosity. Luke goes on to tell the story of how the gospel was bearing fruit in their life, in their giving. Verse 27, in those days, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and predicted by the spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. This took place during the reign of Claudius. And sure enough, first century historians like Josephus validate that the Nile River flooded in AD 45. And because that's where most of the grain came from for that part of the world at the time, there was a famine that followed. Verse 29, each of the disciples, according to his own ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. And they did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. 
So can you imagine that you are a part of the mother church at Jerusalem and all of a sudden Barnabas and Saul show back up and they're telling stories of the great things that God is doing in Antioch and they're like, oh, and by the way, they produce some money bags and here's a great big offering. Well, what's this for? For the famine that's coming. Uh Uh-oh, right? It would have totally caught them off guard because the famine hadn't happened yet. But the church at Antioch was so full of faith that they were willing to give to something that had not occurred because the Spirit was so much at work in their lives and their hearts. They didn't see their stuff as something for them to hoard, but for them to give, for them to steward. And you see, that's evidence of the work of the Spirit in our lives. I tell you guys all the time, you can tell me what your priorities are, but show me two things, and I'll tell you what really matters to you. Show me how you spend your time and how you spend your money and I'll tell you what your real priorities are. And so that's why Luke includes this story, because he wants us to know that this church was full of faith-filled generosity, that they trusted that God was going to provide, and if God could use them to bless the church that had blessed them with a leader like Barnabas, that he'd given them their spiritual roots, then they were more than ready to give back. And what's interesting is the story of the church at Antioch doesn't end there. Luke in chapter 12 moves to another story. He's a master storyteller, like a movie that follows several plot lines. He traces several throughout Acts. But at the beginning of chapter 13, we again see the church at Antioch. And this is reason for why this is such a model church for us. Because they had a missional mindset that through prayer and obedience, they multiplied so that many would come to know Jesus as Lord. Acts 13, verse 1, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. We call them the Antioch Five. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, Manaean, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them off. What did they send them off to do? To be the world's first missionaries, to carry the gospel across the sea for the first time. You see, this is evidence of a faithful church. Did you notice who the Holy Spirit said to set apart? Barnabas, the senior pastor, basically, and Paul, the all-star teacher. In other words, the very best went to God's mission. And what a model for us of the heart of a missional God. As David Livingston, the missionary, said, God had only one son, and remember that he was a missionary. You see, this is where we get a glimpse of the gospel, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that God withheld nothing from us so that we could know him in the same way his churches should withhold nothing from him so that the world will know Jesus. And this is what our church should be about as well. And so to make it explicitly clear today, I want to put this on the screen. I want you to see that the Antioch way should be our way, that we want our values, the things that matter most to us as we pursue the mission of engaging the whole person with the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. There are values that drive that. And so here's the way that our leadership team has framed those values for us. And I think very much they reflect what God was doing at the church at Antioch. Value number one, the gospel first and always. These are kind of our takeaways for today. So I want you to consider, do I value these things individually and as a home, as a family, so that we can, as a church, value these things corporately? Because Jesus is the hope for humanity. We are not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1.16. Instead, we believe it has the power to save. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I want to share with you what was first given as of first importance to me. We want to know the gospel so we can be fluent in the gospel, so we can be sure that it is first and always in our hearts, in our lives, and in everything we do as a church. Value number two for us, because we are designed to play a role in God's kingdom. We are all uniquely called with the gifts and experience that God has given us to play a part in what God is doing in his local church. 
None of you are called to be spectators. All of you are called to be participants. So I pray that 2018 is the year that you double down on exploring your spiritual gifts. That you spend significant time exercising them because like a muscle, they become stronger the more that you use them. Like Ephesians 4 tells us, I pray that you will find your place in the body of believers that we know as the church at Station Hill because I believe that you are here for a purpose. And so as you join with us together, it's going to be fun to see how God works in and through his body of believers to make the good news known. Value number three for us is this. We call it intentional innovation. It's just a way of sharing that we value stewarding God's plans and resources, that we want to be intentional with what God has entrusted to us. And much like this first group of Christians at Antioch, we want to remove whatever barriers there are to sharing the gospel and the good news with people. If there are new wineskins, we want to use them. We want to use the most of every opportunity and resource that God has given us to leverage it for what matters most in his kingdom. Value number four is crossing cultures. We've already spoken to this several times in several ways in this worship service today. But we believe that we are blessed in order to be a blessing. We believe that at the end of time in Revelation, we will see people gathered around God's throne from every ethnic group, every nation, every tongue, every tribe. And therefore, we are supposed to go to those who are different than us. That means, as I've already spoken to, both our neighbors that God is bringing to us from around the world, but we are also called to go to them, to go to the nations, because the light that shines the farthest also shines the brightest at home. And fifth, and last but definitely not least, we believe that because the gospel is for everyone, that multiplying matters, and we are committed to reproducing disciples. That means I have an individual call, that I am called to share the gospel with others, to be a disciple who makes disciples. That means our life groups and our focus studies don't exist for the sake of themselves. But as we disciple people in groups, there should be other groups launched that disciple more people. When we started back in uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2009 in those first groups that were meeting to train, and then when we launched in 2010, we had about six life groups. We have somewhere north of 50 now because we have leaders who have been faithful, right, to multiply groups. And guess what? As these people flood into our community, they need those personal connections. And so we have to continue to multiply. And of course, that means that as a church, we don't just exist to build up our own little kingdom, not at all. Instead, we exist to run people off as the church at Antioch did to build God's kingdom. So I know it's a lot to take in when just these few verses, the church at Antioch, but what a magnificent model for us to pursue. Being mindful that how did it all begin? With a few people who wanted to share the good news of Jesus with their neighbors. So your question today is what's my next step? What do I need to do to engage the mission? There's a great little story that's told. I think it has the heartbeat of the group there at Antioch of a little boy who wasn't raised in church, so he didn't quite understand why we do things the way that we do them. And he slipped in in the middle of a service one time into the back pew. And as he was sitting there, right, as the the deacon was praying for the offering, then as the plates started being passed down the row, he turned to an usher and said, what's everybody doing? He said, well, this is the moment in the service when people bring what God's given to them and they give it back to God so he can use it. And so the boy, of course, is looking through his pockets and there's lint and there's some like chewed bubble gum and a few things in there, right? But nothing fit for the offering plate. So when it comes to him, he does something that that usher said he'll never forget. He sat that offering plate down and he stepped into it himself, right? Because it was all he could give. But what a great picture of surrendering all that we have to the mission of Jesus Christ. Here I am. I surrender all. What step do you need to take this year to be a part of what God is doing in and through his church? Will you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church family. I dearly love them. It has been a joy to watch them grow, to watch how you have shaped them into a body that you have used for your plan and purposes. 
Now, Father, I'm as excited as ever about the days that we have ahead of us. But, Father, thank you for your word, for faithful examples of churches like Antioch, God, from which simply you launched your worldwide mission through people who just wanted to tell their neighbors about Jesus. God, would you find us faithful as well? And it's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.